I've got a variety of bookcases to uh, uh, to uh, to put back. And I'll show you. I did change it. Sure. Just, um, so it says it's gone onto YouTube now. Yeah. I'd, uh, I've got the notification. I've got a variety of bookcases to. I've got a variety of bookcases to. No, I think we're, we're now on uh, on YouTube live on that. Great, thanks, Oliver. That's excellent. You can come again. You've been very helpful. <laughs> so uh, we'll just wait till it fills up. Better than my IKEA bookcase. No, that's not as good, that one. <laughs> no. <laughs> My bookcase has got some really dodgy books in it. That's why I've got a dark, uh, I've got like gardening and Alan Titchmarsh, which was an old, <laughs> wedding, just an old wedding present. But uh, all the attendees are all filling up now. It just takes a few minutes for us to get to 100 and then they get diverted to to um to youtube live do we not see any of them mike we don't see any of them no it, we're just too many but you can if you see someone in there that's particularly of interest you know um you you can we can then promote them to be in a panelist so um occasionally you know you know a real superstar opinion is just you know wanting to get their own education and you can then message them and if they want to come in they can do yeah somebody's uh, just said they can hear us we we can't hear the uh, the attendees <laughs> so it's got one minute to go and that's great we've got uh, and then we'll get going it's all very exciting as i say it's my most stressful hour of the week <laughs> Mike, does it come in the um, the chat or the Q and A at the bottom? It comes along the bottom. Yeah, so someone's uh, <clears throat> done a chat already, um, and um, I don't know what that was, but we'll just mention it. Yeah, we'd prefer people to do Q and A, and then you can answer them sort of live. Okay. Right, we've just got a minute. Yeah, it does take a while for it to all. Or Philip, have you had a good weekend, Tim? Have you been cycling? What have you been up to? Yeah, I've been running this morning. I'm a bit knackered now. Yeah. We did a big cycle in three weeks in Northern Ireland. Can't wait. It's going to be good. Cool. Great. So we're nearly there. Okay, so it's eight o'clock. So we'll get started. Thank you for everyone for, uh, for tuning in. Uh, on the Sunday evening to uh, Sunday Supper with Writington. It's becoming uh, really enjoyable, actually, and we've had some fantastic feedback. So uh, please do give us all the feedback, both positive and negative, because, as you know, the only way we get better in life is, um, is by learning from our mistakes. So please do keep telling us where we can improve. Um, this week is on hip, uh, hip arthroplasty, and of particular interest to the exam is tribiology. Uh, our Sim's going to talk about that. And then the biomechanics of hip arthroplasty and Tim Board is going to talk about that. Um, and then Debbie Shaw is going to um, host the MCQ at the end. So these are three of my um, lower limb colleagues, all of uh, whom are, uh, have been fantastic during this whole uh, COVID uh, uh, crisis for us all. Uh, next week, we've got knee. Um, so we've got a few uh, patellofemoral OA, I think. No, patellofemoral instability, I think, or... Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, put the link out tomorrow in the usual manner. And, um, and that's about it, really. So I'm now going to uh, just a quick housekeeping chat. Can you just perhaps not use the chat? It's a little bit more difficult for us. Just go to Q&A and then the various panelists will, uh, will answer that while the, while the speaker is speaking and then divert the, a couple of the, the chosen questions to that speaker. So with no further ado, I'm going to ask Asim now to, uh, to share his screen, um, give a 20-minute a talk or so on tribology, and then there'll be uh, five to 10 minutes of Q&A. So uh, thank you, Asim. No worries. Can you, can you see that? Does that, that come through? Yeah, that's great. Is that working? All right, cool. 
So hi guys, my name is Aston Rajpur. I'm one of the, the hip surgeons at Wrightington. Uh, what we're going to do is have a run through of tribology. We'll have a look at some basic concepts and then we'll kind of look at its application in the kind of setting of, of hip arthroplasty. The, for, the, for the exam, you need to know both artificial and natural joints, but today we'll basically concentrate on artificial joints and in particular the hip arthroplasty. So in terms of what is tribology, well, it's basically the science of the interaction of two surfaces in motion and its consequences. So friction, lubrication and wear, and those are the three things that we'll start on, have a look at, and then look at how those three things influence how and what we do during a hip replacement. So first thing commonly asked in the exam, what's friction? Well, friction is the resistance to movement of two surfaces in contact, so the resistance to sliding. And the equation that you need to know is the frictional force is equal to the coefficient of friction times by the load. So it's, in, it's interesting, it's independent of the apparent contact surface area. But if you look at it in more detail, if you imagine the kind of the, the ultra structure of a surface, it's got ridges. You know, if you look at it under a, an electron microscope, there's a spherity, there's, um, there's peaks and there's troughs. And as the load increases, the two surfaces squash together. And so the actual true contact surface area increases, and that's why you need increasing force in order to cause it to slide. So the apparent contact area is, is irrelevant, but, it's, but the load influences the actual true contact surface area. So Tim's gonna to look to talk about this uh, in his biomechanics talk, but, but there's no harm in repetition. So not only do we need to know about friction, but also what frictional torque is. And coming from Wrightington, I can't not mention Charlie's LFA principle, right? And I, I ask it in, in an exam situation, what does LFA mean? And it's not low friction arthroplasty, it's low frictional torque arthroplasty, because that was his big concept uh, when he used a 22 millimeter head. And so this is the equation of how we can calculate frictional torque. Uh, and the, the other thing, the, the other factor that we need to consider is the radius of the bearing not only the radius of the head, but also the outer radius of the, of the cup. And so if you use a small head, you're going to generate less twisting force. So you imagine if you're holding a tennis ball in, in one hand and you try and twist it with your, with your other hand, it, it, because of the friction between your hand and the, uh, and the furry surface of the ball, it's going to try and twist your hand. So if you press that harder, there's a more twisting moment on, the, on your hand. Uh, and so that, that's frictional torque. And Prof. Robleski did some nice work looking at its, uh, its effect. And he's nicely demonstrated that with a bigger cup, you're going to basically need less, it's going to generate less frictional force at the outer surface, as you can see by that equation, if you resolve the, the, two, uh, the, two, the two sides of the equation. And he showed that if you use a, a bigger cup, then you basically get less, less loosening. But then we'll, we'll look, look at this again in the biomechanics bit, so I'm not going to dwell on this too much. It has an influence both on the cup and the socket, and this is just a, a diagram of basically a large, uh, sorry, an X-ray of a large-headed metal metal hip replacement that shows sort of cantilever, cantilever type loosening uh, in zones one and seven because of a potential high frictional torque generated uh, in a large diameter metal metal bearing. But like I say, we'll come back to this in the, in the second talk. So that's, that's friction. What about lubrication? So without lubricants, you're gonna have contact of these asperities between the two surfaces. If you introduce a lubricant in between the two, then you're gonna get separation. And if you imagine if you've got no lubricant, then the force is basically gonna to have to shear these peaks and troughs, these asperities. Now, if you've got a lubricant, then you only need to overcome the, the kind of the internal friction of the liquid, which is a lot less than the shear force that you're gonna to require to move the two solids. So you're gonna require a lot less force and that's how lubrication works. Now, you need to know about lubrication regimes and you may have come across the term lambda ratio. Uh, and that basically is the, the ratio of the height of the asperities, what's known as the, the surface roughness, the RA value, which we'll, I'll show you in a diagram coming up, uh, compared to the height of the lubricant film thickness. So if your film, uh, film thickness is less than or equal to the height of the peaks and troughs, then you're gonna get boundary lubrication. So as you can see in the diagram on the left, you've got contact in between the two uh, solid surfaces. Um, so you're gonna have a reasonable amount of friction. 
if you're between one and three, then you're going to have less contact. And then if you're if you're over three, then that's like aquaplaning. Aquaplaning. So if you're if you're driving along and you suddenly slam the brakes, um, and, and your wheels lock up, then when you aquaplane, you've got you know you've got fluid water in between your tire and the road surface. So that's fluid film lubrication. So the way we can get towards that, which is the ideal scenario, because we're going to have less friction, is to reduce the roughness. Uh, off on the surface, uh, increase the actual fluid film thickness. And it's also influenced by the load. So if you've got increasing load, then you can squeeze the fluid out. Um, and also the velocity of the bearing. And this is why larger diameter bearings give you uh, a greater chance of getting fluid film um, because the rotational velocity of the head um, it is bigger because of the bigger bearing. And so it's going to trap fluid within the joint. So if we look at this diagram here, which you may have come across, it's known as a Strybeck curve. Now it varies based upon the different types of bearing that you've got. And the reason why I put this on is, you know, is the main diagram on the right hand side, because it kind of influences how what bearing I predominantly use in my clinical practice. The Summerfield number, it's a, it's a, it, there's a complex equation or there's a hamrock dowson equation, which if you really want to look into tribology, then I suggest you look at that. But basically, if you imagine the Summerfield number is just proportional to fluid film thickness. So the, the, the further you go on the x-axis, the thicker your film of fluid, as you can see on the left-hand side. Um, and so initially in the hard and hard bearings, when you've got little fluid between the two, then there's quite a lot of friction. Whereas in a metal on poly or a ceramic on poly bearing, irrespective of how much fluid you've got in between the head and the, uh, and the socket, the, co the friction is actually quite low. So you imagine when you start movement, you're probably not going to have that much fluid between. So when you, when you stand up from a seated position with a ceramic on ceramic bearing or a metal on metal bearing, before you, the, the actual bearing starts to move or you get into swing phase, there's not going to be much fluid between the head and the, uh, the, head and the bearings and, and the socket. Uh, and hence, you're going to be on the left-hand side of the curve. And so you're going to have high friction. When you start to walk, you're going to get fluid entrainment, you're going to get fluid within the, within the bearing, and you're going to move towards the right-hand side. So the interesting thing is, if you've got hard and soft bearing, it doesn't matter where you are on this curve, you, you pretty much got low friction all the way through. Um, uh, and so that's, the, that's one of the reasons why I have a personal preference towards hard and soft bearing, and we'll come back to that. So what is where? So we looked at friction, lubrication and wear. So where is the mechanical removal of a material as a surface as a result of the movement, as opposed to corrosion, which is the chemical dissolution. So we're not going to look at, look at corrosion today, but mainly wear. But corrosion is something that comes up as well that you need to look at. Now, the debris that's produced is a result of the two asperities. The roughness is uh, basically interacting uh, and that produces wear debris, which is varies dependent on what kind of bearing you've got. The roughness uh, of the different materials varies, and this again affects the lubrication and the wear, wear mechanism. So as we mentioned, this is a concept that you need to understand, which is surface roughness. So this is basically the average value of the, the peaks and troughs. Uh, and the various different materials that we commonly use have different RA values. So polyethylene is roughly one micron, uh, metal is smaller, it's in the order of 10 to 20 nanometers, and ceramic being the smoothest. So it has, if you look at it under a microscope, it has the lowest, um, uh, lowest surface roughness. So there are different types of wear. Uh, first, type, first type is abrasive wear. So this is basically like the cheese grater effect, if you like. So you've got a hard surface and you've got a soft surface. Um, all of these peaks and troughs will cause wear on the softer surface, producing wear debris. Uh, and this will then produce third, uh, third body particles, which are then distributed within the affected joint space. And that has, that has potential consequences. Uh, adhesive wear is basically where you've got molecular adhesion between the two surfaces. This can cause stre high stresses within the polymer, the, the, the polyethylene, uh, and this can cause the um, the plastic to break. And then fatigue is similar to adhesive wear, but it's repeated cyclical loading. Uh, and so um, it, it gets over the numerous cycles that you have, it, it causes uh, a fatigue failure of the surface. Uh, and this can be exacerbated by things like polyethylene oxidation, where you can get subsurface, where you get delamination, uh, and you can get catastrophic failure if you've got a lot of oxidation going on. Not going to be, I'm not going to go through this too much. You can, this is all in Ramachandran, these, these two bits, because this is basically the modes of wear. Mode one wear is normal, 
down to articulating surface producing the wear. Uh, mode two is the one articulated surface versus a non-articulated surface. Mode three is third body. Uh, and then mode four is two, two non-bearing surfaces. Now this is commonly asked in the exam in terms of what do wear particles do um, and the factors that influence it. So depending on the bearing, yeah, you get different types of particles. So uh, polyethylene produces particles in the, in the region of 0.3 to 5 micrometers, whereas metal uh, and ceramic bearings produce particles in the nanometer range. And its effect really is determined by the amount that it's produced uh, and also the morphology and the number and the, and the volume and the type as well. So it's interesting that cross-link polyethylene, for some reason, seems to be more kind of immune provoking than conventional polyethylene. And if you want to look into this, Fisher has devised the concept of functional biological activity. So this is how biologically active the particles are multiplied by the volume. So the, the SBA, the specific biological activity, is determined by the factors that, are, that you can see on the left-hand side of the, uh, 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 of the, of the slide. The, if you look at polyethylene, which is com commonly asked, and what it does, um, the pathways on the right hand side, the main thing that you'll come up, uh, you'll read about is the Rankel pathway, which is in the middle. Uh, and basically what happens is the macrophages, phagocytos, the polyethylene particles, they activate the Rankel pathway, uh, and it causes osteoclasts to be uh, activated, uh, and then osteoclasts uh, end up causing the osteolysis. So what can we do to, to reduce wear? So as, uh, as with any exam answer that we're going to give, you know, there's patient factors, surgical factors uh, and, uh, and implant factors. Surgical factors we'll look at again in the biomechanics talk, um, but in terms of patient factors, if you think about the wear equation, so um, it's our charge wear equation, if you remember the name, and that's, that's given in the middle of the middle of the slide. So the, the volume of the debris that's produced is proportional to the load the and the sliding distance uh, and inversely proportional to the hardness. So the heavier the patient, the more potential uh, wear there's gonna be. Um, the bigger the sliding distance, so the bigger the head, then you're gonna get more of a cheese grater effect. So you, the bigger distance that's gonna be, uh, the, the, that's gonna be uh, traveled by the head over the, over the softer bearing surface and it's inversely proportional to the, to the hardness. So the harder the material, the less wear you're gonna get. So in terms of implant factors, we know that higher molecular weight, so MW's molecular weight of the polyethylene uh, really can reduce wear. Uh, there's various different types of machining and processing, cross-linking being the main one that can reduce wear. Uh, and then we also need to prevent the oxidation and deterioration of the polyethylene as well to maintain its uh, properties. And also the choice of the counterface as well. So on the right-hand side is a 28-year follow-up uh, um, X-ray from, from Wrightington, you can see the hip on the left has got ceramic head, the hip on the right um, is, a, is a metal head, it's also cross-link poly on the left and non cross conventional on the right, and you can see the wear difference between the two. So polyethylene is something that's quite commonly asked about in, in the exam, it's something that we need to, uh, we need to understand. Uh, and so we'll, we'll look at these concepts of, of tra these tribological concepts in the setting of a hip replacement now. So in terms of the ultrastructure of, of polyethylene, it starts off with the ethylene monomer uh, and then no, through something that's known as the Ziegler process, which uses heat pressure and a catalyst. The catalyst is titanium tetrachloride. It produces polyethylene. So you can commonly get asked to, to, to basically, if you get asked about how polyethylene is produced, I will draw that little diagram at the top uh, and explain these three things. Now, if you look at the ultrastructure, it is two main regions, there's two types of structure within it. There's an amorphous region, which is basically like higgledy piggledy spaghetti, and it has also ordered regions, which are crystalline. So you can see on the right hand side, you've got this crystalline lamellae, and then you've got these spaghetti bits in between, and the two are connected together with time molecules. And roughly speaking, it's it's just over, uh, over about 55% crystalline and about 45% amorphous. Now, in terms of how they differ and how they're produced, they're, these are the main things that you need to know about in terms of what resin you start with, what then, how it's consolidated, how it's cross-linked, stabilized, and then, then sterilized as well. Now, pretty much all of the medical grade polyethylene is produced by one company called Tycona, uh, and it's either GUR 1020 or 1050, and these are basically just two, two names of high, ultra-high molecular weight um, polyethylene. And the reason why 
the higher the molecular weight, the less the wear, it's because the, there's more fibers kind of getting entangled. Um, and so there's less bits that are sticking out and less, and there's less chance of those shearing off as the, as the counter surface moves across. So the higher the molecular weight, the less the wear. Now, once you've got the, the powdered polyethylene, it's then turned into the, uh, into the bearing surface by either ram extrusion or compression molding. And it's much of a muchness between the two. There isn't too much difference between the, uh, between the two really uh, using modern methods. It's then modern polyethylene is cross-linked to reduce wear. Uh, and then it's stabilized as well. And we'll go through why you have to do this in order to get rid of free radicals and then it's sterilized. So if we look at uh, some of these bits in, in isolation, in terms of the cross-linking process, the reason why we cross-link is to reduce wear. So um, if you imagine you've got the, the amorphous region, which is the spaghetti-like area, if you create cross-links in between the chains, then there's going to be less chain mobility and it's going to, it's going to be less likely to, uh, to wear out. And the way that you can cross-link is if you apply energy to the, uh, to the structure, it causes breakage of the bonds, generates free radicals, and then the free radicals can then cross-link with the neighboring chain. And so it has, so it causes cross-links in between the, the, the amorphous, um, uh, between the chains in the amorphous region. So I think that's an MCQ question that sometimes come up, comes up as well. So the cross-linking happens in the amorphous zone, not the crystalline zone. Now, not all of these free radicals will cross-link. So you'll still have some residual free radicals. And the problem with that is, if you, let, if you leave residual free radicals and you then expose oxygen to it, then you can basically get oxidation of the polyethylene. Uh, and that oxidation is an autocatalytic process. It's not just once, it doesn't just oxidize and stops. It generates more and more free radicals. And then those free radicals can then react with other bits of the chain, causing chain scission, reducing the molecular weight and then increasing wear. And that can lead to catastrophic failure of the polyethylene. So there's two ways that you can try and get rid of the residual uh, polyethylene, uh, sorry, residual free radicals in the polyethylene, and that's usually using thermal treatment. So either remelting or annealing, and remelting means taking it above the melting point. And what basically what this does, it, it gets rid of the residual free radicals because the residual free radicals are stuck within the crystalline zone. Now, because the crystalline zone is highly ordered and it can't move, that's why the free radicals then can't join with the neighboring free radicals. So in order to, to try and get rid of the free radicals, you, you melt it, it melts the crystals down, makes it pretty much all amorphous and the crosslinks can then join and get rid of the residual free radicals. Annealing is basically taking it up to just below the melting point. So it does mobilize some of the chains, but because you're not fully remelting it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't basically get rid of all of the free radicals. Now there's advantages to both. If you remelt it, it reduces the crystallinity. Annealing doesn't reduce the crystallinity. Now, the consequence of reducing crystallinity is that the crystallinity gives it the uh, gives it the polyethylene strength. So you reduce its crystallinity, you reduce its mechanical properties. So there's pros and cons. Remelting gets rid of most, of, pretty much all of the free radicals that we know, but reduces mechanical strength. Whereas annealing um, it doesn't get rid of all of the free radicals, but maintains the mechanical strength. So there's, the, the companies have differing approaches. Now, if you look at the the wear rate. Uh, between the different um, uh, different doses of radiation, then you can see that the crossing polyethylene, when it's radiated, uh, is has significantly lower wear. So that's virgin polyethylene on the left on the left hand side, and this is seven point five megarad, and then ten megarad. And and usually conventional sorry contemporary uh, crossing polys are in the order of between five to ten megarad uh, ir irradiated. Um, there's no real benefit to going above that level. There's also the effect of the head size, which we'll uh, probably talk about more in the biomechanics uh, bit. Now, once you've cross-linked the polyethylene, then you've also got to store it appropriately as well and then sterilize it. And you can either sterilize it using things like ethylene oxide or again, using gamma irradiation, but it's only usually um, sort of 2.5 megarad, which is significantly less than the normal conventional cross-linking dose. Um, uh, and so it basically doesn't give you any more cross-linking, but basically it just, it just um, gets rid of the, the bugs, as it were. The issue is you've got to do it in an in a, uh, environment because you will still generate some free radicals. And if you've got oxygen knocking about, you'll get oxidation. And then that can, that can cause uh, issues with its mechanical properties. 
Um, and so you can see here the wear rates of different types of polyethylene, sort of sterilized in different environments, have a significantly different wear rates. If you do it in air, um, it's significantly higher than if you do it in a, in a vacuum packed um, environment. So as we, as we discussed, the cross-linking is good for wear rate, but it has, an, has a detrimental effect on, um, on its mechanical properties. Um, it, it reduces its strength and ductility. So there have been some reports of, of line of failure in highly crossing polyethylene, especially when you use thinner and thinner poly when there's been rim fractures uh, that, have, that have happened. Sorry, that's my daughter just printing something in the background. Um, so uh, where was I? Um, in terms of, yeah, so we've, we've mentioned about remelting and, and uh, annealing. Uh, these are those are two things that you need to know about in terms of thermal processing. Uh, we'll move on from that. Now, in terms of if you want to put, if you want to talk about some evidence of is crosslink polyethylene actually any better, then the, probably the paper that I'll quote is Glenn Jones's RCT, where he looked at conventional versus uh, highly crosslink polyethylene. This is a couple of graphs that we've I've taken from his paper. It's in the BJJ, and it shows significantly lower uh, penetra head penetration um, using RSA. Um, for the highly crosslink polyethylene compared to conventional poly. Uh, and also, it's um, the volumetric wear is significantly less, as you can see on the right hand side. If you want to look at meta analysis in terms of osteolysis, this is a forest plot from Kurtz's meta analysis that shows significantly less uh, osteolysis in the highly crosslink compared to the conventional poly. Now, in terms of wear rates, sorry, I'm uh, running out of time. The, um, there is a significant difference in, in wear rates depending on the counterface as well. So we basically talk mainly about polyethylene here, but you've got to also consider what you're going to use for the head. So as we as we mentioned, the RA, the surface roughness of the ceramic head is significantly less than a metal head. So you can see the differences in wear rates between the different types of bearing couples. So metal and polyethylene having the highest, ceramic having approximately 50% less. Uh, and then if you cross the poly as well, then that brings it down even further. Um, and then the, the kind of the lab wear rates of hard on hard bearings are even less. But whether that actually translates into a clinical advantage is debatable. If you look at our NGR, uh, ceramic on poly at 13 years seems to be the, the, the kind of the, the gold standard um, in our poly. And that's reflected in other registry studies as well around the world. So if we just consider the, the counter surface, you know, the commonly asked um, about ceramic heads. The advantage, it's very resistant to scratching. It has a desirable scratch profile. So you might get asked to draw this, which is basically um, what happens if you scratch a metal head versus a ceramic head. And it's basically to do with the pile up, the heap up. So a metal head, you'll get these ridges produced, which then uh, increase the surface roughness and then will gouge through your polyethylene. Whereas the ceramic, you won't get pile up. And, and so you, you don't get that effect. Um, as we said, it's very smooth, the, the reduction in the RA value, and also the wettability as well. So imagine if you've just freshly waxed your car, then it's a very non-wettable surface and it's hydrophobic, uh, whereas ceramics are very wettable. So you're more likely to get fluid film lubrication in a, you know, on a ceramic head compared to a, to a, to a metal head. Um, so yeah, sorry, I think that's 25 minutes, isn't it? So that's a bit of a, a bit of a run through through tribology and its kind of application in a hip replacement setting. Um, for the exam, you do obviously need to know about um, other joints, um, the replacement, etc., and also uh, native sort of natural natural joints as well and cartilage, etc. But um, but that's that, that's a that's a quick run through through um, hip arthroplasty and it's up and tribology applied to that. Any questions? That's great, Asim. So there's um, been a few questions come through on the chat there. Um, one is about you, you mentioned about the size of particles being produced by metal on poly versus ceramic on poly, um, and which of those would produce more inflammatory response. So, um, so in a hard on soft bearing, the the wear debris that's going to be produced is really from the um, is from the polyethylene side, um, and so the volume is is going to be less with a ceramic head because of the lower surface roughness and the lower wear rate. The lo there's a lower penetration of the head, and so the volume will be less. Um, in terms of the size distribution, I don't think there's a there's a big difference between the two. It really the size. Um, distribution comes into play when you consider a hard on soft versus a hard on hard bearing. So with a hard on soft couple, you're going to be have kind of sub micron particles and those are the ones that are bad. 
Uh, those are the ones that generate osteolysis. If you've you got mean a metal, hard, hard in a metal, metal. Uh, in a in a hard on soft, sorry, it's going to be submicron. In a hard on hard metal on metal, we're talking in the in the region of nanometers, uh, whereas mic it's micrometers with polyethylene, but with hard on hard uh, metal on metal or ceramic and ceramic, it's nanometers. Um, the the actual number is massive though. And that's why there's a theory of why metal metal is more immunogenic, because even though the size is tiny um, and its absolute volume might not be that high, the number is significantly higher because, uh, we, because it's very small and hence the surface area is higher as well. Um, ceramic, uh, again, nanometer sized particles, but they're pretty much bio inert. They don't really generate much of an immune response compared to polyethylene and, and metal debris. Mike, I guess we uh, probably need to cut that short now, given that we're running a little late. Yeah, no problem. That was all, all great stuff. So uh, thanks very much, Asim. I really appreciate it. that. was great. So, um, Tim, uh, are you okay now to, uh, to do your talk and uh, yep. share your screen? That'd be great. Okay, so we're going to talk about about biomechanics of the hip now, and Nassim has talked about some of these issues already. But you know, as with everything, yeah, repetition is 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 beneficial sometimes. So the aims of the session are essentially to understand the extramedullary biomechanics of hip replacement. Um, look at go back to really basics with mechanics, looking at moments, Newton's laws, to tackle that age-old problem of the free body diagram of the hip. Um, and then cover friction again and talk a little bit about the principles of the Charlie low frictional torque arthroplasty. So in terms of um, the uh, biomechanics of the hip, obviously you can split this into two sections when it comes to the femur. Uh, we're really interested today in the extramedullary segment and that's all about restoration of the hip geometry uh, for normal function. We're not going to talk about the intramedullary part of it, that's a a different day really. So, so femoral offset is obviously one of the major uh, things we're interested in here. Obviously femoral offset is the perpendicular distance between the, the femoral axis and the center of the femoral head. And the acetabular offset can be defined in different ways, but essentially it's the distance from the center of the body uh, to the center of rotation of the acetabular component. And obviously you can vary both of those things during an arthroplasty. The other important factor in terms of the extramedullary biomechanics is the leg length difference. Um, obviously it's important to understand how you might measure this, what might influence the changes in uh, leg length on an x-ray um, in terms of positions of the hips, etc. cetera. Um, but it's an important thing to measure preoperatively. So when you're gonna do a, a hip replacement, one of the really important factors is to understand what the system is you're using whatever that might be, you really need to understand what the options are in terms of the offset um, and the leg length, where the neck cut might be. Is it a progressive offset with a different stem or is it a fixed offset in different sizes? There are different ways that the, the offset can grow with, with implants. So it's vitally important that you understand the thing that you're actually using. And I say really that, that templating is key. So yeah, everybody should template a hip before they start um, and afterwards go back and look at that and, and analyze what they did, whether, whether it went well, or, you know, what could have gone better. Um, this template is missing some things in terms of, you know, what the leg lengths were preoperatively um, and, and measurements of offset. Um, but uh, I, would, I would counsel that, that really it is key to a hip replacement to do a templating. So offset, what is offset? Well, we've, uh, we've talked about that already. It's the perpendicular distance from the center of rotation to the femoral axis. And it's important to understand that that does change as you rotate the hip. So I've got a hip stem here, I don't know if you can see the stem, um, but you can see that as you rotate the stem, the offset reduces until the offset is zero if you're looking directly down the axis of it like that, okay? You rotate it back and it becomes maximum and you keep rotating around and it go back to zero again. So because obviously the femur is uh, 15 or so degrees antiverted at the neck, 
you can see then to get on that graph to get the maximum uh, offset, i.e. the true offset, you then need to internally rotate the hip when you're doing your x-ray. So that's the basis of doing that. And obviously that's going to be potentially difficult if a patient has a fixed deformity or a lot of pain, um, or you've got a radiographer who isn't that you know, uh, experienced. So you have to be careful when you're interpreting x-rays as to whether or not you're getting the true upset or not. So why is it important? Well, it's important for many reasons. Um, obviously abductor function is, is one of the main things that we think about, but also it's important for hip stability in terms of prevention of dislocation. It can affect the uh, wear rate of poly, and obviously it's gonna cause uh, impingement if you don't get uh, appropriate offset. So you can get impingement between either the implant uh, and bone or soft tissue and bone or um, the uh, implants and soft tissue. So restoration mechanics will allow the maximum range of motion of your hip. So let's talk about mechanics then for a moment. So moments, we know what moments are. Well, it's just a turning force, isn't it? It's very straightforward. And, and I think people do sometimes get a bit confused, but essentially it's, it's, it's just the force times the distance. And then if you can't remember what the measurement is, well, it, it's force times distance. So it's force is newtons and distance is meters. So it's newton meters. And in order to create a moment, you need a fulcrum or a pivot. If you haven't got a fulcrum or a pivot, you're not going to create a turning force. It's just going to be a force pushing it in, in space. So let's think about equilibrium. So when we're trying to work out free body diagrams, it's always good to think back to a sort of basic seesaw uh, arrangement like this. Um, so you can see here that uh, this, is, uh, this is in equilibrium. Um, we've got, and to have equilibrium when you have a, a, a pivot like this, you obviously need the anti-clockwise moment to equal the, the clockwise moment. So this clockwise moment here um, is equal to the anti-clockwise moment. So there's no movement of the seesaw. It's completely static. If we look at the calculation for that, so obviously the clockwise moment, the chap there is wearing a thousand newtons and it's a meter away. So that's a thousand newton meters. And then 500 newtons at two meters away is also a thousand newton meters. So therefore it's balanced, straightforward enough. It's important to understand that when you, the distance that you need in that calculation is the perpendicular distance from the fulcrum, okay? So if you've got a force acting at an angle, it, you need to take the, the perpendicular distance, the shortest perpendicular distance from the angle of that force. So what about joint reaction force? Well, in this situation, the joint reaction force is the, that compressive force at the pivot. So the two guys obviously pushing down the wood of the, the, the seesaw onto the, um, onto the support in the middle. So how do we calculate that? Well, we know from, um, so Newton's first law is that if something is in equilibrium, then the overall forces acting on it um, add up to zero. Um, so the sum of the forces is zero. And in this situation, we only have vertical forces. We don't have any horizontal forces at all. So therefore we can add up the two downwards forces, which add up to 1500 Newtons. So the joint reaction force is equal and opposite to that. And obviously forces being equal and opposite are, is Newton's third law. So you can also think about what happens if we, if we do something with where these people are sitting. So if we moved person A closer to the pivot, so reducing the lever arm, then to maintain the equilibrium, the force would have to go up. So we'd have to put on weight or hold a weight. But then obviously he isn't a thousand Newtons anymore. He's let's say at 1250 Newtons. But that means that the joint reaction force is gonna go up. So because he's, he's increasing the, the vertical forces. So you can see how changing the move, the, the lever arms and changing the forces can influence the joint reaction force. So let's try and translate that to the hip then. So um, as you can see here, this is uh, essentially the same thing. So we've got a seesaw of the pelvis, the pivot is a femoral head, the abductors are one side and the body weight is the other side. So this is person in a static single leg stance. Um, and we can uh, do the calculation. So um, obviously we've got force times distance on one side, ABY is equal to W times X on the other side. 
So if we, if we increase x and decrease y, so we're basically lateralizing the center of rotation, then the abductor force must increase to be able to balance that increased uh, clockwise moment that the body weight is producing. And therefore the consequence of that is that the joint reaction force goes up. And then equally, if you increase, sorry, if you decrease X and increase Y, so you medialize the hip center, then the abductor, the, the abductor force can reduce because it's got a, a better mechanical advantage um, and the joint reaction force can then go down. So we can see that by changing these variables, so moving the center of rotation medially allows the patient to, to, to reduce their abductor effort, which reduces the joint reaction force. And then we can use this understanding to, to work out why a patient does a Trendelenburg gait and how a walking stick um, uh, aids a patient. And these are classic exam questions. So let's look at that in more detail. So Trendelenburg gait, so we've got the same picture here. We've got the same equation. So if this patient lurches to the right with a Trendelenburg gait, effectively by lurching, they bring their body weight closer to the hip center rotation. So they reduce X. So WX reduces, and that means that um, the, the abductor force can go down as well because it's obviously has the, the, the clockwise moment reduces. So therefore the anti-clockwise moment can reduce as well. So the abductor force is a large determinant of the joint reaction force because it's virtually vertical. And therefore the joint reaction force goes down and the hip doesn't work, hurt quite as much. So that's why a patient with hip arthritis will um, walk with the Trendelenburg gait. So we look at the walking stick issue. Um, so again, we can int introduce the walking stick on the, on the left-hand side, which as you know, is, is where you should hold the walking stick if you've got right hip pain. So walking stick in the left hand produces an anti-clockwise moment about the hip. So an anti-clockwise moment is the same direction as the abductor for. So you've added in a new moment, it means that the abductor moment can be reduced. So you re significantly reduce your abductor contraction, which then allows the joint reaction force to go down. So the patient has less pain. So if you get asked the question about um, using a walking stick, then it's always good to talk in the terms of the fact that it introduces an anti-clockwise moment about the opposite hip, which allows the abductor force to reduce, consequently reducing the joint reaction force and the patient's pain. Next question. So Reducing the joint reaction force also has an effect on polyethylene wear. Asim told you before that the harder you push the um, uh, joint surfaces together, the more contact you get and the friction goes up and the wear goes up. So this has been um, uh, known for, for many, many years um, and is uh, obviously an important issue in terms of arthroplasty. So restoration of hip biomechanics um, obviously is important. So, so leg length is important because you don't want to get sued. You want a happy patient. You need to get the abductor strength right because um, you don't want lurching patients in your clinic um, and you want you know, good outcomes for your patients. You want to achieve a stable joint so the hip doesn't dislocate and you want to minimize the wear so you don't have any early revisions. But it can be challenging in some situations. You can see, you know, the, the anatomy around the hip can vary dramatically, um, and it can be very difficult in some instances to achieve um, appropriate offset. But if you don't, say that example second from the left, where there's a massive offset, if you uh, try to put any, almost any kind of normal uh, standard hip replacement in there, you're probably going to reduce their offset, and the patient will be forever unhappy. And I've, I've seen lots of patients um, like this, and I'm sure many of you have as well. So it's important, that's why it's important to template and understand, can I reconstruct this hip with the tools that I have, or do I need some different tools? And again, you're not gonna know that unless you template the hip. So I know Asim's talked a little bit about uh, Charlie's low frictional torque arthroplasty, but I'll, um, I'll just go through some of those principles again, because I think that they're worth going through. So uh, we talked already, so friction depends on the joint reaction force. So the compressive force of those two uh, surfaces and the material. So it's the material properties which generate the coefficient of friction, so mu. 
so it's not dependent on surface area. So let's look at these two diagrams here. One is a, a small head hip replacement in a, in a socket, and the other is a large head hip replacement. So the, good, the way to understand this is that the moment at the head poly interface, we know moment is four stems distance. So F is the joint reaction force and A is the, is the radius there, okay? So the frictional torque that that hip is able to produce is FA. Now that must be resisted by an equal and opposite moment at the socket bone interface at B. So FA equals B times the interface force. But because B is so much bigger than A, the interface force can be much, much smaller than, than F, the friction at the joint. So it's basically a mechanical disadvantage. So you're basically trying to undo a, a really big nut with a tiny little spanner. And it's very difficult. So you can't rip the, pot, the, the socket out of the, out of the patient. The converse situation where you have a large head in a socket of similar size. Again, the moment at the head poly interface is F times A, um, and that's balanced by B times the interface force. But because B is so similar to A, then the interface force is very similar to the frictional force at the joint, which is much larger than in the small head example. So if you have a situation where you have, say, a metal on metal, which is contacting because you haven't got that lambda ratio, patients first gets up, you know, that that frictional force at the uh, bearing surface is going to be virtually the same as the frictional force at the, uh, the socket bone interface. So that's how that's um, uh, put forward. So where, uh, again, sliding distance, we've uh, asked him, did cover that again. So it depends on the force and the sliding distance. The joint reaction force is exactly the same for different head sizes. So having a small head doesn't do anything for your joint reaction force, but it does change the sliding distance. And as you can see here, I've calculated this. So on the left, a small head, um, the sliding distance, you know, if it goes through 180 degrees, you know, that's half a circumference of a circle. So, a, so the circumference of a circle is two pi r, so it's pi r, so pi times the radius of a 22 head, um, which is 30, which gives you uh, 35 millimeters sliding distance. For a 36 millimeter head, that sliding distance is 57 millimeters. So it goes up dramatically with a bigger head size. So a big head's better or worse? Well, it's all about range of movement and stability. So primary arc is, again, a classic uh, exam question. So the primary arc is the range, the, the angular range of movement from impingement of the trunnion on one side of the hip all the way through to impingement on the other side. And that's obviously determined to a certain extent by head size. These two diagrams here, you can see the primary arc on the left is much lower than the primary arc with a bigger head. However, it's not always the case because if you have a much wider neck, then you will reduce your primary arc. So now because you've got a bigger head on the right, but the primary arc is actually smaller than in the small head on the left, because it's about the head neck ratio. And you'll see that some manu many manufacturers um, have altered the shape of the area just underneath the trunnion of the hip to reduce the AP diameter um, to try and improve the head neck ratio. And then obviously jumping distance is uh, the distance that the head has to move to come out of the socket, which is effectively the radius. So a bigger head will always get you a bigger jumping distance. So head size summary, so stability is about head neck ratio as much as it is about head size. Bigger heads um, give you a bigger sliding distance and more wear. Now that's particularly important if it's a scratched head. So you have a scratched metal head then that's going to suddenly produce a massive increase in wear. Thank you very much. That's great, Tim. Thanks very much. So, uh, Asim, our um, Debbie, have you uh, picked up any questions that have come through, or have you got any questions yourself? Yeah, there's a couple of questions from earlier, Mike, um, yeah. to Tim or Asim. Um, 
probably more to ASIM about PE manufacturing processes. A bit more detail on RAM bar and direct compression was um, requested. Now, whether or not we can cover that now or perhaps provide... Yeah, no, I can, I can touch on that. I mean, in terms of mo the modern processes in between, kind of uh, direct compression moulding or, or RAM bar, um, I, I think previously there was there was differences but now uh, both are still used there is kind of hot tighter stuff pressing as well which is used in poly as well which is like arcom which is one of the polys that is out there but there's not much of there's not much difference between all of them uh, basically in terms of ram bar you basically get the pellets or the powder you put it into a machine um, and uh, you basically melt it all together and a, and, a, and a big bar comes out which then you cut in secondary machine whereas direct compression you um, you put it into a mold, which is the shape of the component that you want. Uh, it may need some secondary machining after that, um, but realistically, using modern techniques, there's, there's much of a much as there's not too much between the two. Asim, would uh, you say that uh, you know for doing the exam, it's now a pretty straightforward answer? You know, if you get asked, you know, what what bearing surface would you use for a, a patient having a hip replacement, whether they're young or or older? You know, the answer now is almost, you know, you could get away with just saying ceramic on poly for Absolutely. almost everybody. For everyone, you know. You're never going to be criticised for that. No, I think that's, uh, that, 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 I mean, that in reality is my go-to bearing as well. So, you know, for ceramic on poly, it's, um, it's such a reliable construct um, and it avoids all the issues of, um, of the hard on hard bearings that you've talked about in, in, in terms of the high frictional torque. Um, and, and you see, in a wear simulator, the hard on hard bearings look great. You know, the ASR looked absolutely superb in a wear simulator. But when you put it into a person in vivo, it's a totally different matter. And if you think back to that Strybeck curve, it's um, if you draw a Strybeck curve, you're going to get seven or eight. But basically what it means is when you know, during the gait cycle, the only point you're really going to get fluid film in a hard on hard bearing is during swing phase. All the rest, when you start from static motion, you're going to get stiction friction when you when you load it when you heel strike all pretty much most of the fluid within the bearing is 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 going to disappear uh, and so you're going to be on the left hand side of that curve where you've got high friction um, whereas if you've got hard and soft bearing that curve was pretty much flat so it doesn't really matter which bit you are in the gate cycle you're in a relatively low friction environment. And that's why I like um, hard on soft bearings. I think they're a lot more forgiving. And you, then you don't have the issues of ceramic fracture as well, squeaking, noise generation, et cetera, et cetera. So I think for an example, if you say ceramic on poly, you can't be criticized in any patient, in any age cohort. You know, of, uh, so basically looking at it for a, a very simplistic perspective, a hard on hard bearing surface is spoken of fluid film lubrication. It's a planing water skiing hip. Yeah. Um, but in in reality, you just don't get that in, in no. a patient because of you know various factors. They don't they're not moving at the right speed. You know they stop and they sit down for a while and then they get up and all these issues. And a and a hard on soft bearing is always uh, you know boundary lubrication, so you don't have to yeah. worry about getting that fluid film. And it's pretty much low. Yeah, irrespective of whether it's boundary or fluid film, the friction is covalent friction is always low. Yeah. Asim, I think a reasonable follow-up question in the exam, I think you might have already said, but um, if your choice is ceramic on poly, um, yeah. in any age group? Yeah. Sorry, Debbie, you cut out. Sorry, oh, sorry. Yeah. Do you have a cut-off for age for your use of ceramic heads? Um, well, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I think personally, as a rough ballpark figure, I think if anyone's got a life expectancy more than 10 years, that's a kind of a rough thing I have in my head. I think they need a ceramic head, basically. Uh, and there's a nice, um, if you want to quote some evidence, then there's an American JBGS paper, which did a Markov analysis, looking at the, 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 the cost benefit ratio of a ceramic head versus a metal head. And in fact, I think their conclusion was, if the difference in price is less than three hundred dollars, then I think all the way up to eighty-five is justified based upon the reduction in uh, revisions that you're going to get with a ceramic head versus metal head. So, um, if you do want to justify its use, then you could quote that American JVGS paper in the Markov analysis if you um, if you want. But I mean, r realistically, um, you know, even if I've got a, if I've got a very active 70, 75 year old, I'll put a ceramic head on. Um, but but uh, but you know, people use a kind of arbitrary 65 age cutoff, but 
but you know, uh, there's 65 year olds and there's 65 year olds, isn't there? So, um, so I think, you know, you could justify its use in, in all, basically. That's great. Well, thanks very much. So, um, shall we, um, Debbie, shall we go over to the, uh, the MCQs? We we're, uh, we're running yeah. perfectly on time, actually. And uh, some of these are, uh, so if I, uh, if I launch the poll now, so all the attendees, as you know, all 10 questions, there's 11 questions, actually. Um, so I'll, we'll, we'll do the last one as a separate poll, but all, all 10 are going to show up now. So just in your own time, read through them or Debbie's going to read out the question. She won't read out the various options. You can read them yourself, then answer them now or answer them at the end. Um, uh, you know, you've all done this before. So, so do you want to, uh, to do the MCQ, Debbie? And thanks very much for doing these, Debbie. It's no, good. you're all right. Um, thanks very much, everybody. Um, just to note, it's not all purely biomechanics, as you can see from the first question. I thought it would be pretty cruel to send you to bed on a uh, free body diagram on a Sunday night. So um, some of them are... You need to get that one away, Debbie. I've, I've, I've thrown that one, Tim. I'm sorry. Oh. It used to give me nightmares. <laughs> I'm sure Mike can repost it if you really want to. <laughs> I've not even sent it to Mike. So, <laughs> so we'll make a start. I'll just read out the question. Um, you'll have about 30 seconds to answer it, which is pretty realistic for the exam. So if we start question number one, during the initial stages of a Smith-Peterson approach to the hip, an internervous plane is developed between sartorius and TFL. As these are retracted, which one of the following structures traverses the operative field of line rectus femoris? There are your five options. Give me a few seconds. Next question, guys. Which of the following statements about articular cartilage is false? The superficial layer accounts for up to 20% of the depth. The middle layer, 40 to 60 of the depth. You've missed a word out there, Mike. Um, <laughs> the deep layer accounts for approximately 30% of the depth. Fibers in the deep layer are orientated uh, perpendicular to the joint surface. And the water or water content increases with the depth of the cartilage. Yeah, I'm just going to stick to the questions. So we'll move on. Question number three, which one of the following is a requirement for establishment of a biofilm surrounding a total joint arthroplasty prosthesis? Are the panelists answering the questions as well? No, they don't. That would be just too traumatic. <laughs> I did the tumor one a few weeks ago and I, uh, I didn't share with people what, what I got, but it wasn't very good. Uh, question number four, the advantages of a ceramic head over a metal head for a total hip replacement include lower wettability, greater brittleness, greater malleability, longer plastic region on the stress strain curve and increased surface hardness. Use actually just hang on. So that's just a single answer, the one that isn't a characteristic. Okay, the sum of the forces. This is a Tim question. The sum of the forces on a seesaw in equilibrium is a reflection of which one of Newton's laws of motion? Question number six, friction at the hip surface depends upon all except, choose an answer A to E. Okay, question number seven, measurement of hip offset and leg length 
on an AP pelvic x-ray is not affected by which of the following options? If I'm rushing, will somebody just put something on the chat, maybe? Question number eight, which of the following best describes the resultant forces of an increased on an increased offset stem when compared with a standard offset stem? Sorry, I just had a 10 year old come in and ask for sweets. Question number no. nine, huh? Wait, we said no. Well, you know, I have ignored her for the last hour. <laughs> Question number nine. A 35-year-old male labourer with an isolated post-traumatic degenerative arthritis of the right hip undergoes a hip fusion or arthrodesis. What is the most appropriate position of the right lower extremity? So the final question has actually come up wrong. So I'll read the question. The uh, answer options are correct. So an otherwise healthy 57 year old man has persistent severe hip pain three months post THR. What is the next most appropriate step in management? That should be question number 10 and the options are correct. Sorry about that, Debbie. No, it's all right. Don't worry. I've got it here at the side of me anyway. Do you want to just read that question out again? Just so. Uh... One sec. So, an otherwise healthy 57 year old man has persistent severe hip pain three months post total hip replacement. What is the next most appropriate step in management? All right. That's great, Debbie. So uh, 59 of the 100 people have, have voted. Brilliant. Um, 63 have voted. So uh, So do we get a show of... Yeah, I will do. When, when I've ended the poll, we'll be able to share it. So I think what people do is they, they just write it down on a piece of paper, you know, right. question one and their answer, and then they go back at the end now and the fun. Yeah. So um, not everyone's going to answer them. Okay. So as soon as it starts to say, 77 have answered. So we'll just wait till we get to to a few more minutes. Fantastic. So I remember, um, you know, I got asked to uh, examine the hip in, uh, in as a long case patient. Um, and it's the sort of thing where, you know, you, you, you've just got to get it nailed off, haven't you really? Yeah, you know, absolutely. Clinical examination is key and in the, uh, the sh short and the long cases. And I, and I think it's really worth just practicing on normal hips most uh, definitely. You do a normal hip, you know, you're going to pick up pathology. Um, yeah, in, in see lots of patients. I think from the MCQ point of view, um, hip is largely um, basic science, biomechanics, tribology. There's not a lot of clinical in the MCQ for hip. Would you agree with that, Tim? I, say my, I, I think it's predominantly basic science. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I'd echo Mike's point as well about examination of the hip. You know, if you, you know, just examine your friend, not, well, not necessarily your friends, but maybe family and, you know, and friends just, just get in your head what the normal range of motion the hip is like. Um, and it, if you've got that tactile knowledge in your hands of what it feels like, when you feel something abnormal, you'll know suddenly. If you only ever examine abnormal hips, mm -hmm. how do you know that it's abnormal? You, know, you need to have a baseline. Um, and, and it's flexion and internal rotation. That's the first thing to go in almost every single hip pathology. So, so if, if Tim, you know, if the examiner said you've got one maneuver to assess this patient's hip, is that yeah. what you go to? Yeah, patient supine, flexion of the hip, internal rotation, looking at the face. Yeah. That'll tell you almost everything you need to know. Not everything, but almost. 
So when I was an examiner, um, you know, there was a, a lot of shoulders came in and shoulders are obviously quite painful. Uh, and after the patient had been examined by two or three candidates, obviously we didn't want to keep having that patient examined all morning. And all we did was just flip to the other shoulder, which was completely normal shoulder. And we're asking people doing an exit exam, can you examine this lady's normal left shoulder? And candidates would just look at us as though we're completely mad, as though we're asking them a trick question. I mean, this is just a slam dunk. You know, um, it's just easy points, isn't it? So uh, just examine normal, you know, and see where I did that fantastic uh, brachial plexus talk. Just learn how to do a normal brachial plexus. Okay, so we've, uh, it's pretty static now. So um, at 80% uh, of people voting, which would be around. So <laughs> I'm going to end the poll. Brilliant. And then uh, we're going to share the results now. Okay, Debbie, do you want to just talk through these, why something's right or why something... Yeah, okay. Is wrong? The question is about the Smith-Peterson approach. So the Smith-Peterson approach uses an internervous plane between the femoral and superior gluteal nerves. So first you go through sartorius and TFL, and that is when you come upon the ascending branch of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So the correct answer is B. Um, Lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh is far more lateral. Um, when you're following on in this approach, once you've gone through, gone past sartorius and TFL, the next uh, plane is through rectus femoris and gluteus medius to expose the hip capsule. And then you can detach the straight and reflective heads of rectus femoris for a better exposure. So the correct answer there was answer B. Because Debbie just, I mean, a lot of people have answered lateral cutaneous nerve over the thigh, and that's obviously something which is at, at risk in that approach, but that's much more superficial, isn't it? I think that's that's the sort of trick of the question is that everybody sees that, oh, yeah, that's the one. Um, but yeah, actually, it's already fairly question. deep once you get to Sartorius and TFL. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, next question Which of the following statements about articular cartilage is false? The answer, which the vast majority have got correct, is that the water content increases with the depth of the cartilage. So um, the other options, the superficial zone is 10 to 20 percent, the middle 40 to 60 and the deep 30 percent in general. And with increasing depth, the concentration of proteoglycans increases and water and collagen content decreases. Is that right, Tim? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, next question. Um, question number three. So which one of the following is a requirement for the establishment of a biofilm surrounding a total joint arthroplasty prosthesis? The correct answer is E. So well done. Um, so planktonic bacteria freely float around in suspension and don't form biofilm in general. Biofilm can form very early um, and doesn't require staph infection for at least six weeks. So that's an incorrect answer. So osteolytic lesions are caused by infection, but are not necessarily required for biofilm formation. And exposed metal work is not necessarily required for the formation of a biofilm. Okay. So the, the tip on that one is if you can't remember what planktonic bacteria are, you know what plankton are? They're things that float around in the sea. So these are floaty bacteria. They're not on them on the fil in films on, on surfaces. Okay, so the next question is on ceramic heads. The advantage of a ceramic head over a metal head for a THR include. Um, the correct answer, as most have got right, is increased surface hardness. So um, Advantages of ceramic over uh, metal head are that they are high strength, has a high Young's modulus, uh, hard uh, surface, very smooth surface. They are highly wettable. Uh, they exhibit low wear properties and because of low adhesive wear rates, large head sizes are possible. However, they are brittle and they are not at all malleable. So that's why 
the only possible answer there was the increased surface hardness. Okay, Tim's question of uh, seesaw in equilibrium. So the sum of the forces on a seesaw in equilibrium is a reflection of which one of Newton's laws of motion? The correct answer is all of them. And that is the answer which has been selected least. I think I think maybe this is a, a bit unfair because I think the wording of the question got changed and <laughs> lost yeah, in translation. It's exactly the same. <laughs> is it? It is exactly the same. But it would be the answer anyway, wouldn't it? Your yeah, so you, so you can make so you, the, the, I mean this it, it I think it, looking at it now when I'm reading it back, you know, where, when you say the sum of the forces on a seesaw in equilibrium, you know, that that's implying that it's just um, the fact that, you know, an object remains in rest if all the sum of the forces are, are zero. Um, so it's, it's drawing you towards the first. Um, but but I think what I was trying to imply with the, with the question is that if you have a seesaw in equilibrium, overall, it's demonstrating all three of Newton's laws because the forces are for a weight under gravity, you know, so that's Newton's second law. So that's force, the force is mass times acceleration. It's the mass of the person times acceleration of gravity. Um, and then also at the pivot, you've got uh, Newton's third law because you've got a compressive force and then the, the reacted sort of joint reaction force pushing back in the other way. So overall, the seesaw demonstrates all three of Newton's laws. Yeah. Um, but I think the way, the way I've asked the question um, it is drawing everybody towards Newton's first law, which which arguably is the right answer to that specific question. So just a quick reminder of what the laws are. One, yeah, so a go body on. Go on will then. be in a state of rest or move at a constant velocity unless acted upon by a force. Two, is that a body acted upon by a force will change velocity in proportion to that force applied. This is how I remember it. <laughs> Uh, and three, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah? Yeah. Lovely. Okay, next question, question six. So friction at the hip surface depends upon all except, um, and the options were material properties, uh, the size of the contact area, the lubrication regime, the magnitude of the joint reaction force, and the offset of the hip. Uh, the answer is actually B. In Asim's talk, he mentioned it earlier that um, the frictional force is actually independent of the apparent contact area. So friction is defined as resistance to sliding motion between two bodies in contact. The frictional force is directly proportional to the applied load across the bearing surface, surface but the frictional force is independent of the apparent contact area. The correct answer was B. And obviously most people have answered the offset of the hip. So just to clarify, so if you change the offset, then you effectively change the joint reaction force because the abductor force changes. Um, and the joint reaction force is the compressive force of the hip. So those are the determinants of the uh, friction, the compressive force and the coefficient of friction of the materials. Okay, next question. Measurement of hip offset and leg length on an AP pelvic X-ray is not affected by hip rotation, hip flexion, fixed flexion deformity of the knee, X-ray beam centralization, and a fixed spinal scoliosis. Um, and the vast majority have got the answer right. Um, all of the other um, variables do affect your ability to, to measure um, of course, if you've got a fixed spinal scoliosis, you, know, you can accommodate that in your measurements, but any of the rotational changes, flexion, do affect your ability to measure. That's why we've got to get a proper pelvis um, x-ray, centralised x-ray. Is that right, Tim? Yep. I think well, one people forget is the uh, fixed flexion of the knee, you yeah. know, that produces a fixed flexion of the hip, okay. which essentially foreshortens the... Uh, the, uh, the the leg length at the hip so the, you know in the same way that you know that we talked about this model you know when you rotate it round it changes the offset equally in terms of the, the height of the hip as you go into flexion the height becomes zero at 90 degrees of flexion 
So hip flexion can change the measurement of leg length. So that's why that's important. Okay. Question number eight, which of the following best describes the resultant forces on an increased offset stem when compared with a standard offset stem? Tim, can I ask you what you would have answered for this question? Because I think it's quite... I this one too then. <clears throat> which one? Increased. So it's forces on the stem. Well, the sec I don't quite understand the, the answers. Increased joint reaction force, comma, increased. Increased torsional uh, load, it says. Oh, I don't think I can see the whole thing somehow. Yeah, sorry. I, I think if we have too many words, um, it doesn't allow us. So I apologise for that. So, so the first. So it, so it should. So I. So I, I think it would. It should reduce. If the socket stays in the same place, yeah. And you increase the offset, then the joint reaction force should go down. Yeah. Because the abductor force goes down, but having an increased offset stem gives you bigger torsional forces. Yeah. So the answer is actually C. So. You got it right, Tim. Well done. <laughs> so not far off there for the candidates as well. So just a few more people actually said that the forces would be increased in both um, joint reaction force and increased uh, torsional load. Uh, but uh, the joint reaction force actually decreases with the increase in offset of the femoral stem. Next question. This is a really common question in the exam in the MCQ because it's easy to ask about. Um, so it's about the position of um, hip arthrodesis. The correct answer is, it's actually D. So it sounds like a lot of flexion. This is possibly a slightly outdated question because we do very little hip fusion nowadays, but I think this does still appear in the MCQs. So what you want is um, 30 degrees of flexion to allow swing through a neutralish abduction adduction uh, to allow the most efficient gait and uh, five degrees of external rotation um, is the optimum position. I can understand why people have said 15, 20, 15, it sounds more balanced um, and 30 seems excessive in terms of flexion. Well, that's the, that's the correct position. Have you done any many fusions here uh, of the hip, Tim, Asim? Uh, no, no. Yeah, it's right. just, but in terms of the five degree adduction though, we, um, I thought it was, like you say, it's great, <laughs> neutral, isn't it? You could quite as easily say zero there as well, Asim. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Neutral. So it was of the, of the options, that's probably the most appropriate. Okay, um, clinical question to end on. So serial radiographs, oh no, hang on a minute, sorry, that's wrong, isn't it? Um, this is about the otherwise healthy 57 year old man presenting with persistent hip pain three months following a hip replacement. What would you do next? And I'm pleased to see that the vast majority of people have answered that they would do a blood tests followed by an aspiration. So um, why would you not do a bone scan? Bone scan that, at that stage post-op is probably not going to give you any information. Um, you wouldn't give antibiotics because that might uh, jeopardize your future management options in terms of obtaining um, appropriate microbiology with sensitivities uh, for treatment. And, uh, you know, the, the principle is first rule out infection in a painful hip that early post-op. So that's it. So generally people did pretty well there. I hope everybody got at least one question right and is not going to go to bed on Sunday night feeling, <laughs> feeling depressed about hips. No, that was great. Thanks, Evan. And apologies if uh, when I was copy and pasting them uh, a few words got missed i'll uh i'll surely make sure i check them all again uh, next week 
So right. thanks to the uh, to the hip panelists. Thanks also to Matt and Oliver from Bota coming along, uh, giving us some uh, support. We really appreciate you, uh, you know, uh, advertising these uh, webinars and hopefully they're of uh, use to your members. Thank you very much for having us. No, great. Have you got anything to say, Matt, Oliver? Yeah, well, I'm close exam. Um, so I, I my, my interest, I'll be honest, isn't hips, but I can remember the hip stations and actually, that exactly what you were teaching guys is is just what you have to learn whether you're interested in hips or not obviously it's a case of just getting through the exam and those questions um debbie you were highlighting the ones that i could just see coming up that like the, the hip fixation one after does, does come up or at least it does come up in the practice questions yeah. and also just what do you do next or like that and, and you remember you, as you said you pick the one that's not going to burn bridges you pick the one that in a clinic what are you going to pick something simple we're going to start with blood tests you're not going to rush into some expensive or weird scan so yeah those are some really good questions actually um uh yeah so yeah very good very good thank you credit to tim for his uh, biomechanics questions as well <laughs> Great. Well, thanks very much, everybody. Um, so next week, it's going to be uh, knee, uh, and then we're going to uh, start to move around the body, and we'll get some more guest speakers from uh, other areas that uh, uh, perhaps Writington doesn't have that uh, type of uh, a panel list. So please do email us with any suggestions um, of talks uh, that you'd like us to cover, um, and we really do appreciate all the feedback, both positive and negative. Uh, it's no problem. We're all pretty thick-skinned. So this has been approved now, uh, 1.5 CPD by the Royal College of Surgeons of England, which is great. We thank them for that. They rushed it through very quickly for us. They were able to look at all the YouTube videos. They were really impressed with the quality of the speakers and the, the feedback. So, uh, so that was great. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of running this on a shoestring or, you know, uh, so your certificate will be an email that Zoom sends out as a certificate of attendance. So please use that as your certificate. I certainly can't go to the, the trouble of uh, printing you all individual certificates. I think I would just completely lose the will to live. So it'll just be an email that automatically goes, you attended and that's, uh, and that's great. So we really appreciate, enjoy the rest of the evening and um, hope you have a nice week ahead and we'll hopefully see you next Sunday for knees. Okay, thanks everyone. I'll close it out now. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thanks guys. Thanks, thanks guys. Thank you.